good morning colleagues i hope you're doing well i'm fine um today we are looking at um resource description and access rda and um, i'll introduce you to the toolkit where rda is found but before i do that i'd like to briefly um, remind us of the things we've been discussing we've spent a number of days weeks <clears throat> looking at FRBR, um, and we argued that FRBR is uh, a conceptual model upon which RDA is based. And we know the goal of FRBR is to help us understand how the um, information world can be organized with the sole purpose of ensuring that we enhance users' experience of information, uh, information searching and um, access to information. So um, FRBR is very important in you understanding resource description and access. So um, resource description and access is a cataloging code, and uh, you want to know that RDA was to be called ASCR3 because it was a continuation of the cataloging code ASCR2 revised. However, after consideration, it was decided by experts that um, it should not be referred to as ASCR3 because of the significant um, changes that RDA was introducing. And so, it was agreed that it be referred to resource description and access. I hope that is clear. Now, to access resource description and access, to get the guidelines and the instructions on what to do regarding bibliographic information, RDA comes into a toolkit, comes packaged in a toolkit. Now, you want to know that a toolkit has a number of other resources that it comes with. And one of the major resources is RDA. So the RDA toolkit is not RDA. The RDA toolkit has several information that helps us understand organization of metadata using RDA, uh, cataloging and, and, and classification, if you will. Um, and, and therefore, it provides us with a cataloging called RDA. Actually, in the RDA toolkit, you also find ACR2, the old code, I'll call it. All right now, the toolkit is not free. You have to subscribe for you to access RDA, and there are various ways that you can access RDA. To access the toolkit, you go to the URL presented there. But as a student, you can access the RDA toolkit um, using the free trial. You have 30 days to experience the RDA toolkit. And I would encourage you to click on the free trial there, and, and then you'll be able to have access to RDA for a minimum of uh, 30 days. All right. Having said that, we are going to zero in into understanding what resource description and access is. Okay. So, resource description and access is a standard for describing information resources, regardless of format. Okay not for displaying bibliographic information. And so it gives us guidelines and rules on how to describe information resources in whatever format it comes in, okay? And then resource description and access provides a comprehensive set of guidelines and instructions on formulating bibliographic data, on creating metadata that um, allows us to be able to ensure that, it's uh, that information resource is discoverable, okay? and it covers all types of content, okay? Like I introduced, it relies on FRBR and FRAD. FRAD stands for Functional Requirements for Authority Data, okay? Um, and so RDA views each item in relation to other items, places, and events, and it's very important to think about the implication of that statement. Now, the RDA Toolkit is an integrated browser-based online product that allows users to interact with a collection of cataloging related documents and resources including RDA. So there are various resources, like I said, examples, mappings that you will find in the RDA toolkit. But also, 
the major resource found in the RDA toolkit is RDA. Okay, it is the pro most prominent document in the RDA toolkit's collection of related documents. So you want to um, look at that. So when you have subscribed to the RDA uh, toolkit, uh, for, for for whether if um, whether your institution subscribes or you follow the um, subscription via or you follow the, the, the subscription via free trial, you will be greeted by this very important tab. So you have RDA as a prominent uh, document and to show you uh, the contents of RDA. So you have RDA, the table of contents, uh, introduction, and I'll briefly explain this. So RDA is organized according to sections and within sections, you have chapters nested under it. So you have section one, all right, uh, you have uh, section two, all the way to section 10, and you have 37 chapters. I'll be able to uh, try and show all that. And the next, you have tools, various tools that come within the toolkit to help you understand and actually practice cataloging. So you have element sets, RDA element sets, okay, RDA mappings, examples of RDA records, okay, how to handle books of the Bible. Um, medium of performance, RDA indexes. So you have all these very important um, uh, uh, tools. And then you have other resources, including ASCRA2 and other resources um, that helps you to understand resource description and access. Now, um, another important thing that I would like to introduce you to as you engage with RDA is the vocabulary of RDA, all right? Um, and again, I'll have to remind you um, about FRBR entities. Remember, FRBR is organized, organizes the world of information into three uh, entity groups. Entity group number one, we refer to it as WEMI because it consists of works of intellectual artistic endeavors. And um, WEMI uh, represents a work, an expression, a manifestation, an item. And as we discussed in class, a work is realized through an expression and an expression is embodied in a manifestation and uh, a manifestation is exempl uh, exemplified uh, through an item. All right, now, group two entities consist of persons, family, or corporate body. And these are responsible for the creation of, the realization of, or the production of, or the ownership of um, artistic uh, or uh, works of artistic or intellectual endeavor. And then group three consists of um, concept, object, and event, events, and uh, events and place, and these serve as subjects of the, of the work. And I want to remind you, colleagues, that group one and group two also can serve as subjects of the work. We explained this in the previous video. Now, FRABR has user tasks that it helps us to achieve, and these user tasks tasks are find helps us find helps us identify, helps us select, helps us obtain. And in the video where we are discussing group two and group three, we explain the significant activities involved under identification, finding, selection, and obtaining. For FRAD, um, user tasks involved are, are finding, identifying, contextualizing, and justifying headings or terms that are used as authority uh, uh, terms in an information resource. Now, RDA has redefined many terms that we used in AACR2, all right? And let's see what RDA then um, ha ha has led to these changes because of the influence of FRBR and the language of FRBR. Number one, you want to realize that in under a a uh, AACR2, we code um, the the areas of description we call them areas of description right in rda we're calling them elements or an attribute okay elements right in aacr2 we had for access points we had what we were calling main entry or added entry in rda we are calling those authorized access points for main entry access point for added entry what we called as uniform titles in aacr2 we are now calling them as preferred titles of a work under uh, rda Okay, headings, we are calling them preferred access points under uh, AACR2. Okay, C reference, the variant access points under uh, RDA. 
terms such as author, composer, um, and terms that we refer to differently under the RDA code, they are generally referred to as the uh, creator. All right, creator. So an author is a creator of an artistical uh, or, or, or intellectual endeavor. A photographer is a creator of a photograph, artistic endeavor. A painter is a creator of a painting. Right. So they are generally referred to as creators. And then physical description, um, we are calling that in the ASCR in the RDA. Um, RDA code as career description. Remember, AACR2 actually had is the, the organization of AACR2 also changes quite significantly compared to RDA because AACR2 was organized uh, according to um, the formats of, of the various information materials, but RDA um, deals with information resources regardless of format. And so, you instead of having physical description, we have career description, and we explain. Um, how that uh, changes. So you want to uh, see the book chapter that I gave you so that you have a clear understanding of some of the changes in these things. All right. Now, how is RDA organized? Or what is the structure of RDA? Okay. We argue, and you see in the book chapters given to you, that RDA is organized according to user tasks. Right? User tasks. Remember the user tasks? How do we find? All right. How do we identify? How do we relate resources? Critical. All right. So RDA is organized according to user tasks to help us or to help users identify and relate resources. Okay. I've identified that this is what I'm looking for. How is it related to the other? Oh, maybe I would prefer to get a resource that, uh, that is related to the resource that I have. All right. So it is organized according to user tasks. All right. And then identifying elements. Okay. For each Thing we are describing are uh, addressed separate, separately in each chapter. So uh, you have sections that uh, deal with user tasks, and then identifying elements are also organized or described separately in each chapter. All right. And unlike ASCR2, all right, RD is not organized by class of materials. Okay. So you had uh, printed publications or, or audiovisual materials separately uh, organized in ASCR2, RDA. Is does not uh, is not organized like that. All right, we deal with information resources regardless of format. Okay, so there are no separate chapters for books, printed music, etc. It's just um, it deals with information materials generally regardless of format. So you want to again pay attention to that. So this is how ASCR2 was organized. All right, so you see books, pamphlets, and printed sheets, cartographic materials, manuscripts, music, sound recording, motion pictures. Etc. You know, electronic resources, RDA deals with it by describing career description. And so we'll come uh, to that point and I'll show you how that is done. All right. Continuing with the structure of RDA, okay, RDA is not organized by class of materials. There are no separate chapters for books, printed music, maps, etc. Why? Because we deal with information resources generally and we explain how the information. Materials have been carried through career description. All right. How is the, 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 the organization of RDA then? So RDA is organized or has 10 sections and 37 chapters. And the chapters are nested within sections. And I'll show you how that has actually been done. Here is a summarized view from, I think, an information resource by Lazarini's Fortis. Right. You will see that. The pre preliminary materials, you have RDA uh, preliminary materials, and then you have RDA table of contents, right? And then you have chapter zero, which is introduction to RDA. You want to read that so, so that you have a good picture of what RDA is about, all right? And then section one, chapters one to four, you have manifestation and item, right? You deal with it. Uh, those particular elements, which are group one elements. In section two, you deal with work and expression, which is again group one elements. In chapters three, uh, in, in section three, chapters eight to eleven, we deal with chapter two, uh, group two elements, and these are persons, families, and corporate bodies. All right. In section four, uh, chapters twelve to sixteen, we deal with concepts, objects, events, and places, and these deal with issues to do uh, with 
uh, subjects. All right. And then uh, relationships are dealt with in chapter Z, 5 all the way to chapter 10. So preliminary relationships between group 1, relationships from WEMI to uh, group 2, okay, uh, to group 3, okay, and then chapters 8, 9 to 10, we deal with relationship between WEMI, okay, uh, again, we are dealing with relationships all the way to chapter 10, okay, and then you have supplementary materials, appendices, how you deal with capitalizations, abbreviations, date, relationship, designators, okay, glossaries, and you have an index. So, this is a summarized structure of RDA. You know, sometimes we've asked in the exam, explain the structure of resource description and access. There's a very important question that comes, and uh, this helps you to understand how the RDA is organized. You see, this summarization that I've just given you, colleagues, I go back to each slide to explain those particular summarizations. So section one, section two, manifestation and item. Section two, work and expression, group one. Section three, section four, relation, uh, deals with person, family, corporate body. Section four, concept, object, event, place, subjects. Okay, so you deal with this and we will pay particular attention in sections one to four. You want to pay particular attention. Now, when you Open RDA, okay? You are greeted by get started with the RDA toolkit. So you explain, they explain to you, you have to log in, okay? Browse or search RDA. They explain how you are able to maneuver around the RDA toolkit, okay? When you go to the RDA. So when you see on, on the top right, okay, you are able to log into RDA and be able to, um, uh, Access and navigate the RDA toolkit. Okay. And then um, we explain that the next section of RDA will deal with the recording primary relationships from five all the way to 10 relationships are dealt. Okay. And we come back to FRBR because these things, again, they follow us in RDA. If you didn't understand FRBR, you're going to have challenges understanding RDA. So Go back if you have challenges to uh, 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 understanding FRBR. Go back, look at it again, ask for our help, then we'll be able to assist you if you need that particular uh, assistance. Okay, so remember, colleagues, the work is realized through an expression, and expression is embodied in a manifestation, and the manifestation is exemplified via an item. So it's very important that you know these things. All right, and then. Further examples continue, okay, regarding chapters and how RDA is introduced. It will give you general guidelines on how to record primary relationships, okay? And all these things I explained. Uh, gives you general guidelines on recording relationships, all right? So, uh, RDA is very detailed. It's easy to navigate. And everything that you're trying to do as you describe that information resource using this code, this browser-based, browser-like tool is able to um, help you understand um, and go about the work of cataloging. All right. So we argue RDA chapters are nested within sections and are organized in alignment with FRBR and FRAD user tasks. Each section begins with a chapter of general guidelines. So you're guided. What are the general guidelines regarding a manifestation? What are the general guidelines regarding an item? Okay. So general guidelines include functional objectives, principles. Subsequent chapters include instructions that support one of the user tasks, okay? So, how to identify a manifestation and an item. How to describe a car. How to provide acquisition access. So, remember, RDA is a code, a standard that gives us rules and guidelines on how to describe information resources so that the information resources can be described and be accessible. That's what it does. All right. And so, in identifying manifestations and items, RDA will explain what is the purpose and scope of this particular aspect of resource description and access. And so, it will provide, for instance, a description. The chapter provides general guidelines and instructions on recording the attributes of a manifestation and item that are most often used to identify manifestations. So, it tells you as a catalog, as a user of this. Code what a particular chapter or section is about. 
it describes to you and it tells you and links you to other chapters and sections so that you have a, a good uh, uh, ability to use uh, this particular information resource. Good. So that is what RDA does. All right. I'll move quickly, colleagues, and introduce you to another code in a summarized way. And that code is the International Standard Bibliographic the International uh, Standard Bibliographic Description Standard, okay? And this standard is used for displaying. It's been used under ASCR2, will be used under RDA, some will argue, uh, RDA kind of like exceeds it. But you know, it's important that you understand ISBD, okay? ISBD stands for International Standard Bibliographic Description, okay? It has eight areas, okay? And eight areas that an information resource should be able to have in it providing descriptive information and being able to be accessed by users of an information resource. Okay. Now remember eight areas. We are saying in RDA we are calling them elements or attributes. Okay. So what are the eight areas of an information resource? So there's a title, there's an addition, there's a material specific detail, there is Publication, physical description, series notes, and air and ISBN. Okay, we'll call these in RDA elements. The first element is title and statement of responsibility. The second element is edition. The second, the third element is carrier uh, uh, information. And in this case, you're looking at content type, carrier type, media type, and then you've got publication element. You've got the element on disc physical description, an element on series, an element in notes, and an element in ISBD. Very important. That you understand these things all right and these are critical critical things that you need to understand now this is where you have two standards working together okay isbd gives us elements or areas for describing and dis for sorry for displaying um bibliographic information rda on the other hand gives us a standard on how to deal with content of bibliographic information. How do you identify the title and statement of responsibility, right? How do you write it down? How do you identify edition? How do you write it down? How do you identify uh, the content type, the career type, and the media type? And how do you write, write it down, okay, so that users can access? So this is how the two come together. They work together seamlessly. And we are going to give you some examples. Okay, now when you do descriptive cataloging in RDA, right? And when you do descriptive cataloging in RDA, following a standard such as ISBD, you want to understand some critical things. Okay, there are a lot of elements that I, RDA gives us that are beyond the eight elements of ISBD. That's why some people have argued this could be the end of ISBD. All right, now. You want to understand that RDA has what we call core elements and core if elements. So what are core elements? Okay. Core elements are elements, or if we argue using the old code, old code will argue that core elements refer to elements or areas that have to always be recorded if applicable and available. For example, if you are describing an information resource, a book, the Title and statement of responsibility has to always be available and should be supplied. Why? Because it is important in achieving the goal of cataloging, providing information resources, enhancing users' experience in searching for information resources, for them to easily find, identify, select, and obtain. If it is not there, find a way of making it easy for a user to. I, uh, identify to select to find select and obtain your information resource how do you do that rda gives us guidelines okay so those are core elements elements that always have to be supplied okay if applicable and available okay number two you have what we call core if elements core if elements are elements that are recorded only in certain situations okay so the, some some elements are core if Core elements are missing, okay? Those we'll look at as the core if elements. Now, as you think of doing 
descriptive cataloging and providing bibliographic data to an information resource. Something is critical here. Let's be guided by ISBD. What are the eight areas of ISBD? ISBD says if you provide these eight areas, you've done a good job. The information resource can be located. Therefore, let's think in terms of core elements. Okay? And then I'll take you back to the eight areas. Title and statement of responsibility. Core, very important area. Edition statement, core, very important area. Okay? Uh, what you call material specific details or con carrier, carrier information, very important because a user should be able to know how, in what format, okay, is, 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 is the work realized? How is it carried? Okay? What media do I need to use? Okay? It's very important. That's core. Publication information, core. You know, so we are told that these should always be supplied because they are core and in certain instances, core if. Okay, I'll be able to show you these things or if you read the book chapter, these things are well explained in there. All right, colleagues, I hope this is um, something that you're able to follow. Now, I'll end with a very important uh, 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 description of if you're describing an information resource in RDA, what process do you follow? Okay? Now, descriptive cataloging process in RDA, these are some of the things that you need to do. Okay? You want to understand core elements. You want to understand core if elements. And then, lastly, you want to know that other elements are open to judgment and local policy. Now, elements outside the core and core if elements are optional. And depending on what your library is doing, the kind of CADA that you're saving, or the kind of clients that you save, you can create what we call um, elements that are open to cataloger judgment. So you judge as a cataloger. This is critical in the environment that I work in. Local policy requires that we do this. Then you create and add that particular element. Okay? If needed to help users fulfill user tasks, add it there. If access points, Consider impact on authority work added there. Okay, so you add them because as catalogers you feel like you know these are critical. Let's add them. That's what we call cataloger judgment. Okay, cataloger judgment. Now, here is an example of uh, early lectures, colleagues. Okay, an information resource who have a title page and the verse of a title page, and these two give us this example. So when you look at this. Uh, a, a page that I'm showing right now, you have a title page and a verse of a title. Okay. Now, on the title page, colleagues, you see that the title of an information resource is Records and Knowledge Mobilization, a Handbook for Regulations, Innovation, and Transformation. Okay. So, two things come out here. Okay. You have the title. What is the title of this resource? Records, Management, and Knowledge Mobilization. Subtitle, a handbook of regulations, innovation, and transformation. Who is the author? Stephen Harris. Who is the publisher? Chandos Publishing. Is there an edition statement? No. So you leave it. There's no edition statement. All right. Is there date of publication? Yes. Is there ISBN number? Yes. Now, title is often a core element. Subtitle is a core element. Okay. Statement of responsibility or creator or author. That's core element. Publisher, core element. Edition, core element. However, if the information does not give you the edition statement, you leave that particular section blank because it doesn't give it to you. So in this case, when you analyze, you can identify a title there. You can ident identify a subtitle there. You can identify an author. You can identify a date of publication. You can, you can identify the publisher and you are able to see the ISBN number. Now, you are able to provide bibliographic information based on the information that you see. ISBD punctuation. Now, ISBD will give us how to display information, but there are also punctuation that I used. And these were very critical when we used card catalog. However, even in databases now, it's very important that a cataloger understands these punctuations. And there are several of them to distinguish uh, or delineate the various elements that we use in cataloging. So ISBD has 
various punctuation. So between the title proper and the parallel title, you use an equal sign. It's the same title coming in different languages, for example. Okay, between the title proper and other title information, such as the subtitle, you use a colon. Between the title information and statement of responsibility, you use forward slash. Between the statement of responsibility and other others or other authors, you use semicolon. We'll be able to have various examples of this. Sometimes you distinguish using a comma if these authors contributed equally. Or you use what we call uh, 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 write it as it is, okay, on the source of information. Now, between one area, okay, between one area or one element set, which in this case, title and statement of a responsibility, moving on to addition information, you distinguish that using a full stop space dash. This we call a full stop space dash. Uh, space dash. And then you move. I know any cataloger will have identified that you've transitioned a, a, into the addition information. From the addition information to material uh, type, you again use a full stop dash. In this case, a full stop space dash, then you give us material information. But I want to remind you that this is changing. Okay? This is changing. We are calling this career information. Okay? And then you got publisher. Okay? Place of publication, okay? So you have, uh, again, full stop, space, dash, you move to place of publication, colon, publisher, name, comma, date of publication, okay? And then from there, you give us material designation and extent, okay? How many pages has, has it got, okay? How long in terms of dimension is it, uh, is it? Then you give us that. If it's a series, it's full stop, space, dash, you open a, a parenthesis, you put the title of a series, and if there's a statement of, 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 of responsibility to the series, forward slash, then you give us a statement of responsibility, and then you close the parenthesis, full stop. Okay? You open the space, open with the dash, and start, give us the notes. Again, full stop when you're done with the notes, dash, you give us a standard number, and colon, then you give us the terms of availability. All right? When you do that, colleagues, you will have described an information resource. And this is how cut catalogs were done. Now, remember, when you're done cataloging, you need to provide, provide us with access points. In the old code, we called it main, main access point and added entries, right? Here, we want access points. So what is what are the various ways that this information resource can be accessed? If you know the author, author, surname, you end with the first thing, okay? If a book is written by Peter Banda, then you say Banda, comma, Peter, all right? And then you give us the title and other information that is critical to accessing that information resource. You give us a subject of an information resource, then you have done uh, uh, cataloging and using the punctuation. Very critical. Again, I want to remind you, colleagues, these are the eight areas with another critical reminder on area number three, material or type of publication, specific details, all right? That changes to career type, okay? Content type or media type. I'll give you specific examples. Again, another example, colleagues. Here is an example of a book, The Sage for Significance, Devotional Journal, Robert S. McGee. So we know the title there. The title is The Search for Significance. Right, subtitle distinguished, uh, uh, delineated by colon devotional journal forward slash Robert S. McGee. You've dealt with area one, colleagues. All right, we'll do a lot of examples so that you're able to capture this. Now, apart from use that uh, punctuation we used there, where which was commonly used with cut catalogs, here is an example where you have. Um, um, columns, all right? Columns where you are able to see how the information is provided. Look, we have title and statement of responsibility. You have edition. You have publisher, date, and place. You have uh, career description, right? 
you have career description, you have physical description. Let me name, let me number this correctly so that you are able to uh, to follow. And eight, right? Physical description, series, notes, standard number. Look, as we argued, the search for significance, okay? Title information, other title information, colon, seeing your true worth through God's eyes. Forward slash Robert S. McGee. Edition revised and expanded. Publisher, Nashville, to, uh, Thomas Nelson. Place of publication, Nashville. Uh, by Thomas Nelson, 2023. Text, volume, unmediated. Physical description, 181 pages, 24 centimeters. Is it a series? No, so you leave it blank. Notes, any important note that you have to give. And finally, you give us a standard now. Now you've done a good job of describing. And then remember, let's identify access points. What is the main way that users would access this? They will have to know the author. And so the author is MacGS Robert. And the second way that users would be able to identify this resource is through knowing the title. In this case, the search for significance. And when you do this, colleagues, you will have done a brilliant job of cataloging an information resource using RDA. And now you're wondering, how did he write the title the way he wrote it? How did he know? When to drop the puncture, when to, to drop the capitalization. How did he know uh, how to, to put, to write um, the revised and expanded edition? Remember, get the instructions from RDA. You go into the toolkit, you go to a section that deals with a title and statement of responsibility. Okay? Identifying uh, elements of the manifestation, in this case, title and statement of responsibility. How do I identify this? You go to a section in RDA that deals with the edition. How do I identify this? How do I write it? You go to a section in RDA that deals with the manifestation, publisher information. How do, I, do you write it? All right. And so when you get all the instructions, you end up with something like this. And slowly we are creating a metadata creator out of you. I hope you enjoyed this, colleagues. It's a slightly longer video, but I think you need it for you to be able to have a good grasp on cataloging and classification. I wish you well. Have a good day.